Good morning, everyone. My name is Qing Gao. I'm a professor at Columbia School of Social Work. I'm also the director of the Columbia China Center for Social Policy. Uh, today, it's my honor and great pleasure to have Professor Xian Huang from Rutgers University Department of Political Science to join us to share about her new book. Uh, she's also a faculty member at the Rutgers Center for Chinese Studies. Um, Professor Huang and I met each other quite a few years ago. She reached out to me when she was finishing her dissertation uh, PhD and we talked and uh, hit it off right away. We became collaborators and uh, have since published two papers together. Uh, this year, it's my great delight to learn that her book, based on her dissertation, has been published by Oxford University Press. Um, I wrote uh, uh, endorsement for her book wholeheartedly. Uh, I wrote, Xian Huang has written a brilliant book on the policy and politics of healthcare in China. Her analysis powerfully combines quantitative and qualitative evidence and reveals the deep-rooted inequalities in access to and quality of healthcare enjoyed by different groups of Chinese citizens. The lessons are profound and sobering, and that's exactly how I felt after reading the book. I hope we have uh, um, in, uh, reached discussion today. Um, Professor Huang will speak for about 40 minutes, followed by Q&A. I urge you to type your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, if you have other ideas or comments to share, you can enter into the chat box. I urge you to behave civilly and uh, uh, be supportive of the speaker and other participants. So without further ado, Professor Huang, I turn it over to you. Welcome. Thank you, Qi. Um, good morning, everyone. First of all, I want to extend my gratitude to Dr. Gao. Um, for inviting me and also for providing me tremendous help and support along this way. Um, today, I still feel very, very grateful for her help and support. And I want to thank you all for attending this talk. Um, today, I'm delighted to share with you my book, which is titled Social Protection Under Authoritarianism, House Politics and Policy in China. This topic suddenly becomes interesting to many people due to the novel coronavirus outbreak in which China's health system is of global consequence. Before I launch into my book, I want to briefly talk about people's impression on China's healthcare system. When I chose the cover image for this book, the editor suggests using two photos. The first one, shows a very long line in the front of a Chinese hospital. And the second one, which is the current cover image of this book, displays a crowded room full of parents and children who are doing infusion in a Chinese hospital. I think the editor's choice reveals many people's impression about China's healthcare system. That is, health resources are scarce and a large population in this country have problems to get access or afford health care. As a Chinese saying holds, seeing a doctor is hard and expensive. Kan bing gui, kan bing man. Besides crowding, some people may have seen that some Chinese hospitals are quite advanced in terms of medical equipment and technology, while others might believe that China's healthcare system still lags behind, especially in the rural areas where people still rely on the bare food doctors or home remedies for uh, medical treatments. In my opinion, all these impressions about China's healthcare system are right. In my 13 months fieldwork in China for this book, I did see some high level hospitals with many world class technology and equipment but I also find many low-level health facilities not only crowded, but also lacking qualified or experienced health professionals. So it is simplistic to describe China's healthcare system either as being advanced or being bad work because there is huge variation in it. 
compared to other middle-income one-party autocracies that has spent on average 5.85% of GDP on healthcare in the first decade of 2000s, China has a more modest health expenditure, about 4.77% of GDP. And the Chinese level of total health expenditure in GDP is significantly lower than those of other autocratic regimes, such as monarchy and multi-party regimes, but higher than those of military regimes. As shown in this figure, despite relatively low health expenditure as a share of GDP, China's public health expenditure as a share of total government expenditure is about 10%, higher than the average of one-party authoritarian countries and of the other types of autocracies, such as multi-party and military regimes. Among all other uh, all types of autocracies, only monarchy and no-party authoritarian regimes on average evolve more of total government spending to health services than China does. So a conclusion that can be drawn from this comparison between China and the other middle-income countries, especially uh, autocracies in the 2000s, is that despite limited resources devoted to health care, the Chinese authoritarian state has attached a relatively high priority to providing health care compared to its counterparts with similar political regime type on average. Motivated to explore and explain China's health care system, my book focuses on social health insurance, the main channel for Chinese to attain health care benefits. China's social health insurance was officially established in 1998. It is a contributory program in which individuals must pay the premiums. But the government plays very important roles of financing and administering the program. China dramatically expanded social health insurance during the first decade of 2000. By 2010, over 1 billion Chinese or 90% of Chinese population has been covered by social health insurance. Meanwhile, the generosity of social health insurance increased almost threefold between 2001 and 2008. All this expansion was carried out while China remains an authoritarian state. In other words, in the absence of democratization or significant political reforms, the Chinese government dramatically expanded social health insurance. This health insurance expansion in China is even more puzzling if we look at the distribution of the expanded benefits across the national regions. The coverage of social health insurance is broadened in the central regions, while the generosity of social health insurance is higher in the developed coastal areas as well as the less developed peripheral regions. In addition to regional variation, the intergroup variation of benefits is also salient. The expanded benefits have reached the most vulnerable and disempowered social groups, such as peasants, urban poor, and even rural to urban migrants who were previously excluded from the social health insurance system. But the elite groups such as government and party officials, civil servants, and state employees continue to enjoy the most and best benefits. I took this photo during my field work in China. It shows a typical scene at a local social insurance administration center where citizens register for social insurance, including pensions, health, and unemployment insurances. Individuals, they are instructed to go to different windows or stand in different lines for social insurance registration according to their social economic status, such as their hukou or household registration status, employment status, and economic status. This scene vividly shows the social stratification in China. According to China's social insurance law, 
social health insurance should be pooled at or above the county level. And within each of the pooling units, usually a county or a city, social health insurance is divided into at least three programs. A program for urban employees, UEBMI, a program for urban non-working residents, called URBMI, and a program for rural population, NRCMS. In practice, there is a free healthcare program for government officials and civil servants. To explain the class regional and class group variations in China's social health insurance, I developed this analytical framework, and this is also how I organize the chapters in this book. The framework starts from the authoritarian leaders' political interests and constraints for social welfare provision. As the threat to the regime's stability can come from both elites and the masses, the authoritarian leaders try to strategically balance the distributions of benefits between elites and the masses. So here is a trade-off for authoritarian leaders. When they concentrate too many benefits on elites, they become vulnerable to the unrest from the discontented masses. Yet, when they reduce the privilege of elites and empower the masses by universalizing benefits, they risk betraying the elites on whom they rely for political survival. Hence, authoritarian leaders attempt to expand welfare benefits to the masses while maintaining a hierarchy in social welfare provision to balance between these two fronts. I call such distributive strategy as stratify expansion of social welfare. In fact, expansion and stratification are two essential elements in the Chinese authoritarian state social welfare policy. A consequence of the stratification is that the distribution of social welfare benefits has large inequalities across social groups. Moreover, under China's decentralized and multi-level governance, the expansion of social welfare has to be implemented by local leaders who attempt to meet the central government's policy goals in order to advance their careers, but confront various constraints and vastly different local circumstances. Hence, Chinese social welfare benefits also have large regional variation in terms of population coverage and generosity. How does this book differ from existing study? Why people uh, want to spend $60 on this book? I think there are three selling points. First, the book put the focus on distribution dimensions of social welfare. It reveals the distribution design as well as distributing outcome and implications of Chinese social health insurance expansion. Second, the argument of this book is developed based on intensive fieldwork and reading of Chinese primary documents, such as government files and leader speeches. For this research, I traveled to 16 Chinese provinces and make 68 in-depth interviews with Chinese government officials. I guess this part may be worth at least $30, given the increasing difficulty to do fieldwork in China nowadays. Third, as you may already uh, see in the analytical framework, the Chinese authoritarian state is disaggregated into two parts in this book, the central leadership and the localities. Contradictory to many people's impression about the Chinese state, which is often characterized as a very strong and unified government, the interaction or the tension between the central and the local government such as control and evasion of control are actually the core of politics in China's social welfare expansion. The authority in China's social policy is decentralized and fragmented, with various policy preferences competing both vertically uh, between upper and lower levels of governance and horizontally among different lines of bureaucracy. Some political scientists call the Chinese system as fragmented authoritarianism. 
Under such a system, incremental and protracted reform process, huge regional variation, and uneven implementation of policy are bound to emerge. Take health insurance policy as an example. Throughout China's contemporary history, no single ministry or bureau has been entirely in charge of health policy. Most of the time, rural health insurance has been under the control of the Ministry of Health, while the urban health insurance has fallen under the jurisdictions of the Ministry of Human Resources and Social Security. Health assistance is left to the Ministry of Civil Affairs. Within the central government, at least these three ministries, one leadership group, and one commission are involved in the health policy making, either by jointly issuing official directives or by participating in health policy research or deliberation. The horizontal fermentation of authority at the central level is carried down to each level of local government. The central ministry's interests are replicated in their local bureaus. The Municipal Bureau of Human Resources and Social Security, just like their ministry, have an interest in seeing the social risks pulling for urban employees to succeed because they are responsible for the management and the usage of the health insurance fund for urban employees. Similarly, the Municipal Bureau of Health following their ministerial superiors, support health care provision all through public facilities. Local experiments with social health insurance policy often become a way for individual ministries to promote their preferred reform direction or organizational interest by gathering support among their local equivalents. However, it is important to point out that in China, local interests and priority often trump the ministerial preferences or interests in policy making and implementation. The local bureaus are subordinate to the respective local governments. For example, both Municipal Bureau of Human Resources and Social Security and the Bureau of Health, they count on the municipal government for personnel budgets and facilities. As a result, it is the local government that have the final say in implementing local health policy, including decisions on the detail of social health insurance. Any policy experimentation in social health insurance cannot succeed or last without the support from local political leaders whose policy preferences are shaped by local interests as well as the interests of the central leaderships. Given the background knowledge about China's health system, let me elaborate the argument and empirical evidence in this book. As I mentioned, Chinese authoritarian leaders adopted a stratified expansion strategy in social welfare provision, that is perpetuating a particularly privileged provision for elites while developing an essentially modest provision for the masses to manage the trade-off in benefits distribution between elites and the masses. I specified the formation and development of this strategy by drawing quality evidence from the central leader speeches, central work conference memos, and government publications. This quality materials reveals the coexistence and interwining of expansion and stratification in the central leader's social welfare decision between 1998 and 2011. Specifically, the center established a social health insurance program for urban formal employees in response to the massive laid off and early retirement during the state-owned enterprises reform in the late 1990s. A further strategically expanded social health insurance to other economic centers and social groups after 2003 for both political and economic concerns. Throughout the expansion, the center intentionally and relentlessly protected the elite group's benefits using fiscal transfers, 
social legislation, and personnel control so that the stratification of health benefits among social groups was maintained. Through a quantitative analysis of the center's fiscal transfers to provinces between 1999 and 2009, I further found that the center allocates more funds to the provinces with large elite groups, such as fiscal dependents, state, uh, state sector employees, and even urban hukou holders. Both the distributed strategy and the fund allocations of the Chinese central leadership reflect its intrinsic interest in social welfare distribution, that is privileging the elites while providing the masses with basic benefits. Given the center's distributed strategy, local leaders have both a mandate and discretion in social welfare provision. Using provincial data about the coverage and generosity of social health insurance, I found there were four significant different models of social health insurance expansion in some national China. A dual model, given, more, given generous benefits to more people, is prevalent in the East Coast. A privilege model, given certain groups more benefits as found in some Northwest ethnic minority regions and the capital city, Beijing. A risk pooling model, given meager benefits to more people as common in provinces along the Yangtze River. And the statical model, given meager benefits to only certain groups as present in Northeast and Southwest parts of China. Regression analysis shows significant uh, uh, correlations between local social risk and the expansion of social health insurance coverage and between uh, local fiscal resources and the expansion of social health insurance generosity. How to explain such statistical correlations? My fieldwork indicates that high social risk such as population aging, labor outflows, without adequate fiscal resources at the local government's disposal, motivate the local leaders in the central China to focus their expansion efforts on enlarging the risk pool of social health insurance, resulting in a strict yet inclusive model of social health insurance expansion in this region. On the contrary, abundant fiscal revenues combined with low social risk, incentivize the local leaders in the ethnic minority regions or the large cities to enhance the benefits of social health insurance exclusively, leading to a generous yet exclusive model of health insurance expansion. In contrast, a combination of both high fiscal revenues and social risk give rise to a generous and inclusive expansion of social health insurance in the coastal areas, while a combination of low uh, fiscal revenues and social risk in the rest regions is conducive to a strict and exclusive expansion, which is basically maintain the status quo of social health insurance. Given the central and the local government's distributed strategy and policy, we want to know more about the social health insurance beneficiaries at the individual level. In other words, who gets what, when and how from China's social health insurance expansion. To answer these questions, I use two national social survey data sets to examine the variation of social health insurance enrollment among different social groups between 2003 and 2011. The quantitative analysis shows that social health insurance expansion did significantly broaden Chinese citizens' access to basic health care. However, the expansion not only reinforced existing social cleavages, such as the urban-rural divide, but also generating new divisions such as labor market insider and outsider cleavage within the urban population. Now let me show you three figures to illustrate the stratifications of Chinese social health insurance. In this figure, the 
darker color refers to the more generous social health insurance program, such as the free government health care program and the urban employee health insurance. The first row refers to the China Health Nutrition Survey data collected in 2004, and the second row refers to the data in 2009 when expansion of health insurance has begun. We see that after expansion, people with rural hukou were more likely to be enrolled into the less generous health insurance program, such as the rural health insurance, while people with urban hukou were more likely to be enrolled into the urban employee health insurance. The urban rural divide in health care is not only existing, but reinforced by the health insurance expansion in China. With the same data, this figure shows the stratification of social health insurance by employment status. From 2004 to 2009, individuals without formal employment were increasingly enrolled into the less generous health insurance program, such as the program for urban non-working residents and the program for rural population. The third figure shows the stratification of health insurance by economic status. The most obvious change from 2004 to 2009 is that employees in the non-state sectors, such as collective-owned or private-owned firms, they were increasingly enrolled into the less generous health insurance program, such as the one for rural population or the one for urban and working population. All the curvatures I just showed you are interwoven in such a way as to fragment the society and privilege a least group over others without breaking the society into a single and deep class line. Some people might wonder how sustainable the stratification can be given the trend of social insurance integration in China in recent years, which seems contradictory to the center's interest and its previous efforts of maintaining the stratification of social welfare benefits. So far, there are two types of health insurance integration reform in China. One is interregional integration, such as integrating a specific health insurance program among the counties or districts in a city's jurisdiction, so-called city-level integration. The other one is inter-rural integration, such as merging the health insurance program for urban non-working population and the program for urban or for rural population. Despite some encouraging signs in the central and local policy for health insurance integration, strong commitments on the part of the central leadership has not shown so far, such as health insurance integration beyond a city or health insurance integration beyond the non-working population. Rather than promoting citizens' equal social rights, the center's motivation to integrate social health insurance is to facilitate uh, urbanization, a new engine for China's economic growth in the coming decades. The center is very cautious about pushing for full integration of social health insurance because a fully integrated social health insurance will destroy the hierarchy in social welfare provision and eliminates the elite group's health care privileges. This move will contradict the authoritarian leaders' core interests of maintaining the elite's welfare privileges for regime stability. However, some efforts for partial integration of social health insurance, such as the city-level integration or the partial the urban rural integration, um, are beneficial to the Chinese state because they help mitigate the regional disparity and social inequality, which has been generating increasing social grievances. So just like social health insurance expansion in the first decade of 2000, the integration of social insurance represents a political dilemma for the Chinese authoritarian leaders. Therefore, it is not surprising that Despite frequent discussion of social insurance integration in government documents or in media, 
no laws has been made to enforce it in China. In Xi Jinping's keynote speech at the Chinese Communist Party's 19th Congress in 2017, no new initiative or directive were presented concerning social health insurance beyond the urban rural integration. Now, let me put China back to the cross national comparison to end this talk. Compared to other Asian countries, China's social welfare expansion over the past decades is outstanding. According to Asian Development Bank's Social Protection Index data, the breadth or coverage of Chinese social protection in 2009 was 0.80, meaning that 80% of the eligible population were actual beneficiary of social welfare, ranked only after Japan and South Korea among 37 Asian and Pacific countries. Given that the social protection coverage in China was only 0.45 in 2005, this suggests a remarkable progress by the Chinese government in social welfare expansion. In a stark contrast to its remarkable achievements in terms of social welfare expansion, the generosity or the depth of Chinese social welfare provision is lower than the expected level given its economic development and income level. According to ADB's uh, data, the depth or generosity of Chinese social protection in 2009 was 0.17, meaning that the average benefit level of Chinese social welfare was only about 0.04% of its GDP which placed China only slightly above Thailand. As for stratification or inequality in social protection, China's level is above the mean of Asian countries and stay at a quite high level compared to the East Asian democracies. As the Chinese authoritarian leaders less rely on the majority of the population directly to stay in power compared to democratic leaders, the Chinese leadership tend to concentrate welfare benefits and allocate more resources to the elite groups or to the groups with political clout and connections. Finally, I want to briefly talk about the implication of this research. The finding of this book implies that, in some cases, social welfare expansion is not a result of democracy, but a result of resilience authoritarianism. Not only the national leaders in authoritarian states might expand social welfare provisions strategically to achieve the balance of interest between elites and the masses, but also the local leaders in authoritarian states may be motivated to proactively accommodate local needs in social policy, as we have found in certain times of Chinese provinces. However, this does not mean that there is no difference between democracies and autocracies in social welfare provision. A key difference between the Chinese welfare states and the conventional welfare state in liberal democracies is that in China, social welfare policy is viewed as a means to achieve political stability and economic development, rather than an intrinsic social rights for individuals. Hence, the distribution of social welfare benefits in China has been and will continue to be heavily shaped by the political interests and calculations of the state whose social policy reflects the various political, economic, and social challenges facing it. That's all my presentation. Thank you for listening. I look forward to having your questions and comments about this book. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Huang. This is fascinating, having read your book and having uh, being able to get this very concise overview of your book is uh, super informative. I urge those in the audience to type your questions in the Q&A box or either or in the chat box. Uh, I will direct the questions to Professor Huang. Uh, so Professor Huang, to begin the conversation, I have a question directly following up to your uh, conclusion and implication discussion. Mm -hmm. So um, you mentioned 
there might be a link or might not be a link between social welfare expansion and democracy. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking about the US healthcare system. Mm -hmm. uh, democracy often works not to support social welfare expansions, but to curb it. Um, how do you, uh, to put China into the global context, mm -hmm. and probably in particular in comparison to the US, mm -hmm. what role does democracy or the political regime play uh, mm -hmm. in, in the social welfare policy expansions. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious in particular because you mentioned in 2016, China has this initiative of integrating urban rural mm -hmm. uh, residents mm -hmm. healthcare systems, mm -hmm. but not workers or employees. Mm -hmm. um, if that's achieved, does that benefit the rural residents a lot? or not so much. So what's the significance of that integration? And going forward, what role could democracy or authoritarianism play in this direction? Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Gao, for this uh, great questions. Um, I think a short um, uh, answer um, to the question, what's the relationship between political regime or democracy and welfare state is that I don't think there is a necessary connection between democracy and welfare state because um, um, in history, many welfare states actually started under authoritarian rule. Well, think about Germany under Bismarck. And um, so within democracies, we have seen some more generous welfare states as we have seen in the Scandinavian countries. We also see some quite minimum or liberal welfare state as we have seen in the American system, right? And the same applies to autocracies. Among autocracies or non-democracies, we see huge variation of social welfare spending or social welfare protection among auto uh, autocracies. And China might be, uh, can be placed, if we think about there is a spectrum, right? Um, one on, on one end is very limited welfare state, and on the other end is very generous welfare state. I think China is moving towards the more generous end. And I, I think it has something to do with the uh, two fundamental functions of welfare state. One fundamental function of welfare state is income redistribution. Right, it's a, it's a mechanism of distributing benefits among uh, the general public. And it can be very politicalized. For example, in some non-democracies or even in democracies, the politicians might use social policy for political purpose, right? Might, might form some clientism uh, to providing benefits to the targeted groups for political interest. That is one function of income redistribution and has your research has informed that uh, Chinese social welfare has modus magnitude of income redistribution and it has regional variation. You also have variation over time. And the other functions of welfare state is risk sharing or risk pooling. It's pooling the, the, the risk um, among different social groups or even pulling the risk for individuals in their life course, right? Think about pensions program, unemployment pro programs, or work injury program. Um, I can see that uh, um, the risk dimensions of Chinese social welfare state might constitute a stronger and more powerful driving force for social welfare reform and expansion in China in the near future. Um, like this year, during or after the COVID-19 pandemic uh, in China, we have seen some new healthcare reform initiative. And uh, that is to try to promoting the, uh, or enlarging the pool of social health insurance funds. So put the money from individual saving accounts, healthcare saving accounts into the social pool to really increase the risk sharing, the risk pooling functions uh, uh, of social, well, uh, social insurance. So I would say that both driving forces, income redistribution or uh, benefit distribution, as well as risk sharing are driving uh, any country's democracy or non-democracy social policy 
and we can see it's very interesting to see sometimes one of the forces might dominate, but sometimes it's most time, I, I believe, it's the interaction of these two forces driving welfare state development. Thank you so much for your thoughtful response, uh, which I really appreciate. And I know you're working on a new book on the risk pooling uh, aspect. Yeah. So um, uh, look forward to that uh, work.